We are here live at the basement of a bank, far away from the gunfire in West Baltimore, free and safe from jockeys falling off of horses. We are here to talk about Baltimore soccer because we are off the crossbar. I am the coach, Pete Eibner. This is my co-host and co-coach, Adam the Miz Mizell, and we've got a great show lined up for you today. Tell us about it, Miz. Well, first of all, the last time we, we were gathered as we were departing, I mentioned that I was going to go make a withdrawal at the bank above. Apparently, you have to make a deposit first. You've got to have the cash in. I mean, what is the deal with I don't I don't understand how... You if know. you want to get money out of someone or something without putting the deposit in first, you got to go further down Joppa Road and talk to Louie. Okay, gotcha. Louie will give you the money. Is there a landmark I'm looking for when I get them? Just look for a guy named Louie. Louie. Okay, gotcha. So, yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be here as always. How was your week? Good week, I hope. Week was great, and I am so pumped up about today's show. Listen to who we got. Who do we got? We got Timmy Whitman, Baltimore Blast legend, live in studio with us. We got the mystery question of the day. We got soccer topics that affect the Baltimore world of soccer, such as got soccer points. I'm the, I can I'm collecting them as I sit here, just so you know. They should be redeemable for like stuffed animals and stuff, or at least some cotton candy. Definitely. Actually, at the EDP tournament, they have a cotton candy machine. I wonder if you could do an even swap. I think that should be, we bring it up. Let's bring it up at the next meeting. And finally, we're going to close the show with a great interview with none other than U.S. national team player and soccer legend, Landon Donovan. I can't wait for that. It's going to be cool. It's going to be we're awesome. We're hitting the big time. As always, Off the Crossbar is brought to you by Ideal Health Chiropractic. Dr. Adam Maddox has a way of making you feel better. He specializes in athletes specializes in basketball players, really does a great job with soccer players. When I got a kid that's got a jacked up back, I send him to Dr. Adam, he's back on the field, ready to go. And I'm telling you, man, he did a number on me because my back Again? was jacked. Yeah, I, my back used to look like that, what's that one movie where the guy's spine is like all like... Clockwork Orange? Not Clockwork Orange, but the other one. Oh, Showgirls. Not Showgirls, the other one. Werewolf in London? Yeah, American, that's the one. American Werewolf in oh, London, yeah. where his back is like, spine is like popping out of it. Gotcha, head. okay, yeah, yeah. One visit to Adam Maddox, he like pop, 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 pop. Got my spine in. Before you knew it, I was back in my breakdancing crew, winning the breakdancing fight in the middle of the subway. It was unbelievable. Thank you, Dr. Adam. It's impressive. Impressive. So what's going on with you, Miz? Not much. I'm ready for my 17th favorite part of the show. What is your 17th favorite part of the show? The mystery question of the day. The mystery question of the day. What do we got cooking this week? I got to tell you, um, this week, I, well, last week, actually, I was pumping my gas as usual, and I'm just sitting back enjoying the, the flow of the, the petroleum, just pumping right through great the system. Great fumes. Uh, smelling it. I was, it was great. Um, but, you know, when you're doing that, they have this music pumping through the system. You know what I mean? And you're, right. just, you're sitting there, but for whatever reason, the pump was very slow. Um, and there was a rock ballad playing in this. And I'm like, ah, you know, not bad. But then it got me thinking, like, what's my favorite rock ballad? And then I was thinking, okay, so I know what mine is. And then I, I, I wanted to, to turn that into a question for you. Um, but my favorite Air Supply, making love out of nothing at all, is the greatest rock ballad of all time. The mystery question of the week is, change my mind. That is a great one, and I'm not going to change your mind. I'm going to expand your mind. Okay. Check this one out. Extreme, more than words. Mm. Great song. If you, I, I'm not kidding you. You would put that song around when, when you were one-on-one -on -one with the lady, and all of a sudden... She's hydroplaning around the room. That's how effective that song was. That was from the massage oil, though. Could have been from the massage oil. I had it all worked out back in the 90s. I like that. That's a great song. I need a little bit of drums in there for me, a little bit more crescendo, but it's a great song. I, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to open my mind up. But when the guy hits it like the, hold me close, don't ever let me go. That's powerful, man. That right there, pow.
And it sounds just like that, only you're a few, like, platinum records short of, you know, matching that guy's hey, voice, I, I would think. I, the two things that I cannot do, is I can't sing, and, uh, and I can't comb my own hair. That's true. So, Miz, tell me, what's cooking in your world? What is on that great mind of yours right at this second? Well, you know, there, there's always a lot of things on, the, on my mind, but one of them was, a, as I'm listening to the rock ballad, it got me, you know, going back to when I was a kid. My mom had a Chevette, um, and there was a particular wave, like, Chevette owners would give each other. Chevette owners waved to it's one another? It's unbelievable, right? I, I don't know what it was, but, uh, you know, you're packed in there. You can't really see what's going on on the front seat, but... Um, have you ever seen that with other vehicles? Yeah, yeah, you got the, you know, my favorite one is the the, the Jeep wave. Jeep, you're in the Jeep, you see mm, somebody with Jeep another wave. Jeep, and you pow. You know, you also got the motorcycles, they're driving along, you know, and all right, of a sudden right. they give each other this. You know, why don't, you know what, I need to be in a club like that. In a waving club? Yeah, I want to be like socially where I can wave to somebody, know that I'm in my own little club. You know what? We should start like a bald guy wave club. How about the lawnmower club? As you're cutting your grass, Mike next door cutting hit and just maybe but you don't, Yeah, but you don't mow your lawn like on the street. But now think about this. We're starting this, Miz. The bald guy wave. I'm not kidding. You see okay. another bald guy on the street, you just go like this. Right? And he knows that you're in the same club. Why should we be did why should we not have our own club? It's, why should you know there's yeah. others in here that would definitely do it? So Miz, this is what I say to you today. All right. When you see a bald guy, if you're in the club, just give him a welcome back to Off the Crossbar. I am the coach Pete Adner. I'm with the co-coach Adam the Miz Myzel. Miz, I am fired up. I am too. I'm pumped. Can you hear the music playing? I can. The spaceship is coming down in the lobby right now. I also hear the phone ringing. Is that the lawyers? Or? No, the okay, smoke machine. is, a, and, and They're telling us we can't play it, but I can hear the music. They're saying no, but everything about us is saying yes. We have our very first guest as the spaceship door lowers. We have coming to our studio, Baltimore soccer legend, none other than number 17 in your program, but number one in your hearts, Tim Whitman. <laughs> Look at this, it's a standing ovation with a sellout What's up, crowd. Tim? How you oh, doing, man? man? Right, good. How's What's up, buddy? Good. How are you? Yeah, hey, by the way, stop getting out of that chair. By the way. Yes. Yeah, I'd say shaved the, the about ball three, guy. three years ago. No, no, no. We started. But a I use number now. two. Yeah, number two and a number one. We got no. listen. We, we got the wave. wave. Oh yeah, Coach Pete. You ever see like wave. jeeps when they go like that to one another? Yeah, oh, or or motorcycles. Shaved head, you go like that. No, when you're in the club. Yeah, yeah. What do we do? You do that? that? Yeah, that do it? that. That's it. Okay, I'm in, man. He's yeah. in. Yep. I'm in for good now. <laughs> We're up to three people. Three people in the club. Unbelievable. Who knew? Let me do. By the end of the day, we'll be up to seven. There you go. So, you looking over me. Now you're good, man. Here's what we got. First of all, we're so happy to have you here. Now, this is really a cool moment for me because you probably don't even remember this. I'm 12 years old. My best friends are Mickey and Chip Coachella. Mm -hmm. We're playing soccer at Herring Run Courts. Chad Cooper, Justin Sabisky, the Shergott brothers. We're playing. Who comes down in, the, in his prime? Tim Whitman, hot summer day, plays soccer with us. It was one of the coolest things ever. Took me from a level of, hey, you know, I want to be a good soccer player, to, hey, the guy that I'm watching, uh, that, that my family's paying to go watch me, uh, he's here kicking the ball around with us. One of the coolest things about it. Now we're sitting here talking soccer. It is awesome. And he's still so important to this day, he gets calls. He gets here, like, <laughs> that. I got to stop. He gets this. calls this in, in the middle so, of TV I'm, shows. I mean, it doesn't I'm matter. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> there, there we go. Okay. There get we another go. one. Yep. So, Take us back there. You you you're you're playing soccer. Just got done Calvert Hall, right? Yes. Yes. And and you get you picked by the Baltimore drafted by the Baltimore Blast, or the, they just sign you? There was two teams. Right. The, the indoor was just starting. That was two years in. Right. Uh, the main thing was the NASL, which was is the MLS now. It was right. basically then. So the but the NASL and indoor just started. So. I had to get drafted by NASL. If I didn't, then my chances of going anywhere else were going to be slim because there's no bargaining tool, right? So uh, they had a draft for the NASL, and I was drafted by the Tampa Bay Rowdies. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so once that happened, then I get a call from 
from the Baltimore Blast, right, from Kenny Cooper. And uh, that's how that all came about. And the NESL was folding right. at the time, so I made the leap to, uh, to the MISL, which was the uh, Baltimore Blast. But uh, my heart was always outdoors. I, I'm, indoors just come very, very rarely played, right. right? But it was in Baltimore. I thought it was cool. But I signed for Tampa. I was supposed to go to Brazil for three months, right? And signed. It was called a rookie contract at the time. So once uh, I got involved, I went down there, did the tryout. They were set on sending me down. Baltimore's calling back and forth. So now I'm, I'm between the two. I'm waiting for Tampa to call me back. Uh, six weeks go back, go by, uh, nothing. And now I'm saying, I don't believe this, right? right. I'm, I'm going for Baltimore. I'm playing for Baltimore. The day I'm going to sign for Baltimore, Gordon Jago, who is the coach, calls me and says, listen, come on down today, right? We're going to fly you down. We're going to sign. You're going to Brazil for three months. Come back and play our regular season. So it's too late. I said, I'm signing. I already gave him my word to Baltimore Blast, and, and I ended up staying there, and the league folded uh, the NESL. So the rest of my career, I was pretty much with Baltimore. Wow. Well, that's crazy. I didn't know that they were that close to losing it because that was – those are the golden years of Baltimore soccer for indoor. Oh, no, no doubt. Well, the soccer then, so the NESL was it. Right. Right. The other teams were in indoor just starting off. NESL folds, right? Indoor takes over. Players don't know where to go, right? They're paying good money for indoor, which right. was a bit of a phenomenon right, to where, why, I have no idea, right? But all the players now are starting coming from Europe. And there's only one league, right, in, in the States at the right. time, right, because there's no outdoor at that point. Uh, so they st started flooding the indoor game with all these top players that you hear of from before the Jungles, the Godas, Stamankovic's, right? And I could go on Kai Hoskivy. These players were playing for World Cup teams, you know, and playing for their national teams. But the money was good. So that's why there was some kind of phenomenon where it just took off. Yeah, it was that nuts. league back in the 80s, it was crazy. Yeah. I mean, it was – you could see – the best players in the country, if not some of the best players in the world, playing 6v6. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy. It was unbelievable. It was different. I think it was just one of those. I don't think it will ever happen again at that, <clears throat> at that level because now the outdoor is prominent. I mean, the, right. uh, the English League, the Premier League, the La Liga, right, the MLS. I mean, it's just... So you're saying the timing was the just timing, perfect. The timing, you couldn't do that again. Right. Because there was no other leagues, the money was good, and all the players flooded back. I mean, you're never going to get a top player from Europe to come over and play an indoor. Right, You're right, just right. not, unless yeah. he's 45. Right. Right, and so uh, they're very good players still, but it's just the league has, money-wise, has gone down. So people are going to chase the dollar. That all, I, you know, I always wondered that, of all the guys that you just mentioned, um, what was the guy where you felt, and it might not have been the best goal scorer or you know whatever, but what was the guy you always walked away from at the end of your career and said, "This guy's the best player I ever played against or with, or that I'd or ever been involved with." Right. This, I, I me. It's got to be hard because there's me, so many. Well, you know, me personally, aside from Tim Whitman, I, obviously I mean, no, the best. We're way down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I tried to be good at something, but not. I couldn't reach certain levels. Uh, it's very difficult to say, in my mind, you need a defender for that forward to be good. Right. Right. Vice versa, for that forward you, uh, to be good, the defender will be good. Right. And the midfield and the workhorses. So there's, all, there's always different parts of the game. Uh, for me to say this guy was the best indoor player, I can't because Stan Stamankovic was a guy who I played for. He couldn't play defense if he tried. Right. right. So my, my job when Stan was playing was I'd bust my ass, work, blah, 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 knock it to him anywhere, run far post, I get it back. Right, so right, right. that, but he couldn't come back. I didn't expect him to. Right? right, so but he could have been the best at this. Jungle Zagoda could have been the best at this. The, the midfielders could have been the best at this. Me, I prided myself in my work ethic, right, and being a two-way player. Uh, I could be a forward, a, a midfielder, or back at that time. And I went in as making it as a forward, right. But there was Tim Whitman from Calvert Hall. What the hell? Right. What does that mean, right? But right. you got guys from Yugoslavia. It was Yugoslavia right. back. Right. Right. Brazil, England, you know, played for the national sure. And I'm 17 at the time, and I'm supposed to take his spot. So what they did is you make the team, let's see what you can do in the back. And so right. at the back, that's where I, I kind of took off, and I was going forward, 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 and that's how I ended up staying where I was. But then a lot of times I played in midfield. When in San Diego, I played in the midfield. If they needed something up top, sometimes I played up top. So. Hey, and that brings me to something else. You just mentioned Calvert Hall. Now, mm. 
I know enough about you to know that you are, to say the least, a free spirit, right? You are <laughs> a yes. little, a yeah, little, yeah, yeah. a little hard to, to put in a box. Fair enough. You can't. I won't. Can't. You can't. Well. So Calvert Hall had a coach, Bill mm -hmm. Karpovich, legendary coach, mm -hmm. known for being a bit of a hard ass and a bit of a disciplinarian. Sure. How did that relationship work out for four years with you remaining at Calvert Hall? <laughs> How do you stay The rest in part's quite good. Remaining that, that Mr. Karbovich uh, lived like down the street from where I did. Right. Right. He lived a couple blocks down, so that was my transportation. Right. So that I would go to the corner. He would pick me up. We'd go to Calvert Hall after the practice. He would take me back home, vice right. or whatever, the whole year. So, Mr. Carp was a disciplinarian in the sense that I think people get the word disciplinarian mixed up. Right. Disciplinarian is showing up every day, having a work ethic, you know, having passion, uh, not just you got to do this. If you don't, you're in trouble. Slap, bang. It, was, it wasn't that as much. He was hard and he can't, he was a bit of a hard ass. Right. It doesn't affect me whatsoever. Right. I mean, for me, I'm going to go out and do what I have to do every day right. and to sure. reach certain goals that I want to reach, regardless whether it's Mr. Carp or somebody else. So for me, let me be. Right. If I'm doing my job, right, and which I, I, that's what I was striving to do, then you should have no problems. School-wise, now, that's a different story. I think he, he kept me around. Yeah. There's no doubt he kept me around. I mean, I could tell you a thousand stories, but uh, I don't know whether it's good for It's a place to tell them. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> I really had time Mr. for 998 Quinn, of them, though. Mr. That I would, something happened between me and some teacher, and then before Mr. Carr called to the principal office, I'd, I'd see him, he said, not again. Right? He would say, not again. <laughs> and it was, a, I was an indefinite uh, 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 detention. Right. I don't know what that is, right? I was there all the time. <laughs> I, I suspended every year, right? I it just, but again, which is with me and him, I would go to his house on Christmas, on holidays, right? right? I was like his uh, fifth son almost. More than a coach. Yes, absolutely. We'd, we'd, I'd, I'd go to his house. We would talk about, you know, the game. We'd talk about other things and life in general. So, uh, yeah, that, he was a good man to me. Yeah, that's great. Me. That's great. Now, it's funny because I went to Curly, and he was probably <laughs> the one guy, like, you wanted to beat. Like, if you played soccer at Curly... You couldn't stand Calvert Hall because they were sure. always good. Sure. And you wanted to stick it to Mr. Carp because they always won. Right. Always won. So I'm playing for Pep Perella my senior year. Peppy, I know And Peppy. Peppy had nicknames for everybody. Sure. Well, my nickname for Peppy turns out to be Peaches. 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 So mm -hmm. he, here, Peaches. Um, it's not the best nickname. No, but it's, yeah. So I slide tackle somebody on the sidelines mm -hmm. right between, it's at Curly, Right between the Curly bench and the Calvert Hall bench, Pep's like three feet from the from midfield. Carp's like three feet from midfield, and Peppy encouraged me. Great tackle, Peaches. So Mr. Carp looks at me. He's got his arm, arm. turned a little sideways. <laughs> and he's got this. Out. He couldn't smoke an eighty. Oh, okay, was, all right. That in the beginning. He and could. he and he looked at me, and, and again, I picture him like Darth Vader. And he went, Gives that yeah, good. nice tackle, peaches. <laughs> <laughs> and I just yeah, lost yeah. my yeah. mind. Yeah, he'd give you that look and that, you know, ah, yeah. oh, it was coming. Yeah. 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 Good man, though. Very good man. So based on, like, to, like where you see it today, um, you know, where, what do you think the biggest difference uh, is between today's indoor game and where it was in, when you were playing in the, in the 80s sure, and sure. where it was huge and all right. these. And obviously it's not as big anymore, but w where do you see it and why do you see it that way? Uh, back then, again, with there's, if there's money involved and if there's only one league, where do the players go to? Right. right? So they're going to gravitate to where the money is and where they can play right? because players still want to play. And, again, I don't think that will be duplicated because of – so many different venues that uh, players can go to now. They can go, like I said, to all those other leagues, plus then you've got the USL, then you've got all these other leagues, then you've got indoor, right? Uh, so I don't think that will be duplicated. But as far as the players playing now, they probably have more of a clue how to play the game of indoor because, again, it was just right. starting sure. off. Uh, <clears throat> is it the same caliber player? Uh, you know, probably not. 
right? They're very good players. Don't get me wrong. There's some very good players. Uh, but I think if you had a choice now between outdoor and indoor, and you're an upcoming college player or high school, high school right. player, sure. your choice is going to go as far as you can, maybe to Europe, mm -hmm. the, the U.S., and then from there, then you might go indoor. Because, again, the money and what's on television all the time, and it's bombarded yeah. with yeah. outdoor and these pros and, you know, all these top Messis and Ronaldos and Neymar. I mean, that's what, as a kid, you're three, four, five, six years old, you, you look at something and you say, that's what I want to do. Absolutely. So if I, I see that, and that's what I did as a kid, I thought, I, I want to be that. That's what I want to do, right? So I think this is why you don't see much of the indoor anymore, right? And it's not televised. It's not on the news too much. So you're not, your aspirations aren't going to say, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. right? I want to be a messy and name Sure. On. That's a great point because you look at it. Now, if you're a kid, you can watch mm -hmm. any channel and see soccer almost any day of the week. You can DVR hundred different games. When I was a kid, you had one game a week, and that was soccer made in Germany, and you had to watch it on Channel 26, and had to get the antennas just right to see who Karl Heinz Rummenigge was. Right. And that was that was and my the thing. Foil and all that. Yeah, there was no yeah. question. So, Coach, let, I mean, let's get to it. Uh, Tim is an innovator back in his day. Tell uh, us about it. The this is news. the number one thing. Like, you, you could do a million things. You could lead, you could set records for scoring, win championships with a blast, do whatever you want to do in life, but you will forever be known for the guy that took a simple volleyball shoe Here we go. and turned it in <laughs> to a legendary <laughs> soccer shoe. There Every is. kid had to have this shoe. <laughs> had to. Had to. You got to tell us how this came about. How did you get the indoor court? Well, this I did not make. I couldn't make it because I didn't have a shoe factory. I didn't have leather the proper uh, stitching. So what I did was there was a gentleman named Jim Pollahan. Jim Pollahan. I don't know if you remember. Player. This is way back, right? This is my. By the way, should be on our all mustache team for really? soccer players. He Jim might Pollahan. still have it. I don't he even had a, it. He had like he had a, a pretty nine, good one. He was a big one. Okay. I have a big one too, right? right, right, right. A mustache, I'm talking, right? <laughs> right, right? So Jimmy had these shoes on, and this was my first year, right? And I'm looking across. I'm in the locker room. He's over there on the other. I can remember this right now. Uh, on the other side, I'm looking, I thought, they look nice. I like that look because they're kind of white, right? right. I saw the red in them, everything. They had red on the bottom, the original ones. So I saw, and I talked to him. And so I tried the shoe one, right? I thought, this would be brilliant because I need something light. Cause that's what I want. That was my whole thing. Something light that I could feel. And then I didn't want uh, a heel because I felt I was going to turn on that. Right? right. You know, I do my ankle. So these were kind of molded one piece. And I thought well, I can go in any direction. They're light. So, so, so boom, got a pair. And that was it. Uh, so many of the players that then were wearing like the Patrick oh, Missile were, and Patrick Sambas. Mm -hmm. When Sambas, I first started, right. I think the Sambas Patrick's. And then it went to, oh gosh, whoever was giving us contracts, right? Uh, a lot of times you got free shoes and different things to wear them. Some of them were. So when you horrible. busted those things out, like uh, the first, well, did guys look at, what are you, what are you wearing here? What are you doing? They just, because I was kind of, again, a little different, right? right I right. would kind of be to myself a lot of times. Sure. I would be in the corner. I was telling uh, Pete about this. My locker was in the corner so I could see everything. I didn't want to be in the middle so people, I wanted to see everything. Sure. So I would watch everything, learn, take this in, take that in. Uh, and so I could care less. I did my own thing, uh, went home afterward, do a train. I'd go down to the park after training or something like that. Uh, but I, I could have cared less. When's the first I time anyone ever, ever, anyone ever noticed it and said something to you about it? I don't know. I remember playing against some people and them saying some really? you know, derogatory Things to me, you asshole, and you, you know, who do you think you are? Because I was American, I'm a right. Scottish guy, and a Scottish guy thought he was hard, right? Thought right. he was hard. Right, right. But, hey, 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 you do that move again with those, <laughs> with those, uh, with those white. That I can't say that. I right. right. uh, cut that, please. But any anyway, with those white <laughs> shoes, right? I'm gonna crack you, right? Next time you, I'm, so right, well, sure. And think about the time. No one wore white shoes to play soccer. Everything was black shoes. Sure, right. So Timmy comes along, white shoes. What do you see now? You see white shoes, yellow shoes, fluorescent pink. You Lime see, green, yeah. Innovator, first to do <laughs> Didn't it. Didn't even know it. Didn't even first know. to do it. There you go. Now, one other thing. I got to say, I, one of the coolest moments as a kid, going to a blast game, 11,000 people there. It's mob. There's nothing else going on. You were at that game. Games on the radio, games on television. 
They beat the St. Louis Steamers, and I can't remember if it was 82 or 83. 83. 83, yeah. From the championship you're talking about, right? Win it. Win it all, right? What must have that been like? Because if you remember, Colts left town. So this is the sport in the winter. This is it. So what must have that been like? I guess the way I picture it. I forgot the name of the bar. There was a bar that... P.J. Crickets? P.J. Crickets! Yeah. So I picture P.J. Crickets. I picture you going to P.J. Crickets, and you're hanging out with Michael Jackson and Mick Jagger, and you're behind the velvet rope, and you got girls, like, hanging all over you, popping bubbly, and, and you know, and it's people coming up, and Bobby McAvans dancing with all the, you know, and you just got, it's like mass hysteria, and you, and you, and you go to what some, What would like, Bobby McAvans have been saying at that point? Ah, oh, Timmy, it's a great atmosphere at P.J. Crickets. <laughs> what, is he 90 at the time? <laughs> Hey, so, Bobby. Oh, Bobby McAvan, it's a great atmosphere at the Maryland I think that's Sports Irish. Arena. <laughs> it's Irish. It's yeah. Ish. Braveheart, you need. It's Scottish. 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 So, you're like, but yeah, it's great. And then, then, like, you end up, like, you're hanging around with all the celebrities, and you end up going to, like, some eyes wide shut party with Al Sanders and Mayor William Donald Schaefer. What was it like? Al Sanders was not on the top of my list, no. Uh, but... It's funny when you win, right? It's the it's the build up to it, right? right? Which keeps you involved. It's right. If we're going to win, that's your goal. You win, and you're kind of ecstatic at that moment, right? Mm-hmm. But it, it's different. I can't ex- I can't explain. Maybe you should ask some some other people. But it's like whew, we did it, right? Yeah. And then you're so you're you're so uh, excited in a sense that you want it, but then you're almost thinking, well, what's the next thing? Yeah. I, I believe it or not. So now it's uh, decompressing almost. You're coming down a little bit, right? You want to keep it going because everybody's going goofy and everything's wild right. after the game, right? I, then in my mind, I'm saying, I accomplished my goal. That's one of my goals. Okay, now I've got to accomplish this goal, right? That, so that's automatically in your mind right afterwards, believe it or not. Oh, so I, I from, agree. When you're looking from the outside in, it's all these things you're talking about. When you're in the inside, yes, you are happy. You're with all your, your boys and everything. And, and then your, your girlfriend, your wives, or both of them are there at the same time, right? And then you're doing this, you're doing that. Yeah, that is cool for a minute, right? right. Uh, but it depends where you're at in your career, what you're going, how you're going to react. Right, mm-hmm. so I was let me see, 17, 18, 19, 20, 19 or 20. So that was my first one, right? And I was kind of like, you know, what's this all about? This is cool. I'm playing, I'm starting, I was part of this championship. I, you know, I, I scored a goal here or there, right? I, I did this, right? And you're and you're thinking that, and then after you're because you're off for three months, then I'm thinking, I'm just getting out of here. Where am I going? I'm going to Cancun for you know a month, or I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting right. out of here. But the party afterwards was pretty cool. I had my uh. A couple friends with me. I remember I had this convertible, and my brother. You think I'm pretty bad, but my brother's way over the top, right? He's hanging out of the convertible with the top <laughs> down, going up towards Gate Street because I had to drive towards my house. Right. Out there waving and moving all around. So it was pretty cool that way. Yeah. yeah but then, then cool. the next day is like, now yeah, what? Right. Jeez, that high. Where's that high? Where am I getting this high from? Right. Right. So it's back to the drawing board. Back to work. Yeah. Back to work again. I've always felt like when you win something big. When you know, if player or coach, when you win something big, my first reaction is relief. It is because you want it so bad, and you claw and you scratch and you fight and you work and you do all that, and it's relief. And you you, you celebrate a little bit, but then I get anxious because I want the next thing. Yes, and then that's that is part of it. It's almost like you can't enjoy. You'll hear players say, "I've got to. I want to enjoy this now." They take it. They're taking off a couple weeks or a right. month. I need to enjoy this. Take this all in because everything. <laughs> Everything's so quick. Now, a hundredfold, like Real Madrid's in Barcelona, a yeah. hundred thousand people. I mean, I can imagine the, what these people are going through, right? So then they got to live up to re- their reputation, and it's the next one. Who's taking my job? So that all comes back. So you got to just say, I'm forgetting everything. I'm letting go of everything right now, right? I don't want to talk soccer. I don't want to see it. I don't want to have nothing. I don't want to be around fans, right? Because after a while, uh, you kind of you want to try to break this whole thing down and put it in perspective, because if you don't, then you're going to be in trouble. Right, Something's sure. going to be wrong. Right, Something's right. going wrong. Sure. So you got to put that in perspective. And uh, but yeah, I would I would never trade any of it in a million years. Very I would cool. Never trade in a million years. I'm sure you can go all, on all day with the stories. Oh and my the guys. gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. But but make no mistake that 
the blast play a, a, an integral part in the landscape of, of Baltimore soccer's history. It just does. Absolutely no question. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it was, I mean, it was huge at the time. And, uh, you know, I think people appreciated it and, you know, players did. It, it, put, it put it on the map a little bit. Yeah, uh, Soccer sure. at the time. Now, like I said, things are a little different, but, hey, it was brilliant. You want to you know, stick know, around and talk some uh, youth soccer you with us? I'll do whatever you want, yep. Cool. Welcome back to Off the Crossbar. I am the co-coach, Adam Miz Mizell. This is Coach Pete Eibner, and we're joined today. Honored to have uh, player Tim Whitman from the Baltimore Blast. Uh, back in the day when it was actually the most, the biggest thing going on around here for sure. Uh, and then also nationwide as the indoor game kind of took off and uh, we were fortunate enough to have the blast, which was a championship team back then. So thanks for joining us, Tim. Um, we're going to slide into a little discussion about youth soccer. Uh, Tim wants to stay around. He's got an opinion on everything. Absolutely right. And, and this is no different here. Um, but do you, so you're, you're not really involved with youth soccer as much anymore, maybe a little bit here or there, but you're familiar with the process and the system of the got soccer points. That's a huge part of what we deal with all the time and, and, and how it's perceived to the, to the parents and, and coaches. So wh where, do you, where are you at with it? Well, my boy played through the whole system, mm -hmm. right? And I can remember parents, and then I also was uh, uh, – a co not a coach, but uh, what am I looking for? Director, director of coaching. Coach, director of coaching at uh, Arundel mm -hmm. High School. Uh, not high school, Arundel Association. And the parents would always say, we, we're, we're number whatever on uh, got soccer, got soccer. We're, we're number 50 or something in got soccer. And they would always look at this. And I, I, would, have, I would have talks to the association. I don't know why anybody's worrying about this got soccer. Who's putting these points up because you go to a tournament and you get more points because then you go to a, another tournament, it's not that good, you get points and put, And they're missing the whole thing, I think, about the game itself. Let's not worry about that. Let's worry about how we're doing, right? Uh, developing these these kids, and developing is a, a word that we can go anywhere with right, developing. Sure. Right, sure. Uh, and focus on, don't focus on this. I mean, because I don't know who's putting this all together. And what does it really mean anyway, at the end of the day, whether you're 50, number three, or number, even if you're number one, I don't understand what this is all about, right? That number one soon, soon could be number two, could be number 10, and then I got to continue regardless of what that is. So these parents, they sometimes, and these kids, they live by it, right? And the problem with it is, this is what I see as the biggest problem. It takes the focus off, let's make better soccer players. And it shifts the focus to, let's recruit the best soccer players to make the best teams so we can make more money. And that's the bottom line. Tournaments can charge more money if they have more points. Teams can charge more money if they say we are elite. And what ends up happening? The kid who's working hard and playing hard, but but maybe isn't at the level, maybe needs just a little more push, pushed off to the side instead of pushed forward. And now you have, when kids are 16, 17, 18 years old, maybe four good teams in an area where you used to have competitive teams in Dundalk, Highland Town, you know, Herring Run area. You would have competitive teams in Towson. You had, now you get two, three clubs, two, three competitive teams. And I'm not saying that it's all got soccer, but I think that's part of where it starts. I think there is some use for got soccer points. So what I mean by that is this. I'm a tournament director. I have 400 teams in an age group that apply. There's no real way to, to kind of sift through those teams and figure out, okay, well, how do we put you know, Joe's Deli against FC United? You know what I mean? If we put this, this grouping together and have them play each other, it's 12 nothing. So I need some sort of barometer that tells me which teams are uh, at which level. That way I can make the better schedule in my tournament and keep it competitive. Fair That's enough. the use, right? Fair enough. And I use it as a coach to see what my competition has done against like competition. Sure. Because if you know going in, well, this team has really struggled against teams at our level, maybe I approach it a little different. Or I can also call a coach that's friendly and say, what does this team have that I got to look out for? That's what it's useful for. But aside from the tournament directors, 
Name me one good thing, either of you. Name me one good thing that comes out of God's soccer points. I think I think it's just another means, as you I agree with you 100% on that. Uh, the problem is that why do we, as coaches or as players or parents, why do we have to focus on that, right? This, this to me, as a club, owning a club or being part of a club, that's not my, my, my issue is how many points we have. I, I, my issue is how am I getting you to the next level, right? This, as a club, if you're the director of the club or if you own the club or if you're a coach of the club, maybe that's instilled right off the bat, right? right? We set a present right off the bat that this doesn't mean anything. Stop looking at that. Just social media again. It's a, you don't have to look at it. You don't have to pay attention to it, right? Right. Other than for what the point you're talking about, where we are because of who we're playing, right? And we want to stay in that that level, right? That I can see as a good point. But other than that, it, it it's instilled from the club to we don't care about this, right? You're setting a precedent right in the beginning when the, somebody comes into the club. This is what we're we are catering to. This is what we want to do as a club. And I think then that maybe the kids, maybe the parents, maybe they don't worry about it anymore. But when you know the coach is concerned, when he brings that up or the club brings up, yeah, we're number one in blah 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 to, to sell it, right? Well, then you know, as another club, I you know, you know, let them do what they got to do. So because you're going to stand by whatever you stand by, and follow that follow that path I think and as a coach it's it's definitely a challenge to kind of you know I've always been a guy that's tried to keep my kids off of it right and parents off of it because that's not the focus for us our focus was getting but hey look once we get so good to where you come out and you you roll a ball out and we're you know we're beating teams far and away by five goals then we can you know we'll have enough time to play around and, and see who's ranked on God soccer we'll never get to that level therefore we're never going to waste our time and put any energy into focusing on God soccer points that energy and time can be used to focus on getting better right individually Absolutely. collectively and so forth and so on what if i said to you and i was a coach right and i said to you hey and you're coming in you're a kid and you're a parent and you're glad to be in the uh, the club and i say listen these things don't matter to us whatsoever i mean but they believe in you. You're not just saying it and just saying, sure. okay, because yeah. that's the right thing to do. I think you'll have that kid. I think you'll have that person believe in what you're talking about, right? Because one, they're looking up to you. Two, they're expecting things from you. And then if you guide them this certain way, right, and they can trust you and you have integrity, you know, they're going to start to believe in what you say. And then now you're, you're starting to form a team. You're not worried about all this other stuff. So I think it starts from the beginning. Any kid that I get into my club or the parent that comes into my club should be instilled these, this is what we believe in, right? We do not care about this. And if they honestly believe that, right? You honestly believe that as a coach, I think they'll feel that. And then they're, you know, I, I, I will say this. When you honestly believe it, you can stay that path all you want. But I'll tell you where you lose parents. Mm -hmm. God's honest truth. Parents look at that and say, I have to get my son or my daughter on that team because that team's a little bit higher ranked, and that team will get my son or daughter a scholarship. And that's where any core value that you try to, it kind of gets chipped away a little bit. And it's very, it's a very hard road to go. And again, is God soccer the problem? No, but it's part of the problem. And at the end of the day, how many players are we developing in, in Baltimore, or even nationally, that make a splash at the national or international level? Our uh, last 10 years. Zero for that I know of. I mean, there's great players that we've produced out of this area, no doubt. And I think overall we're in a good spot geographically where we have a lot of good players and great players that have went on to, to be very successful at Division I colleges right. and things like that. Beyond that's another level, and that's where it gets sticky. But why is that? That's a great question. Some, well, someone Pete smarter Karinji than me got, can answer that. I, Pete, I saw him at the convention, Pete Karinji, mm -hmm. and he said he was ticked that none of these people are getting picked up by the national teams. Right. So I was in there for five minutes, and you can ask Pete. And I said, well, look who's coaching them. A lot of these kids, right? So, yeah. And that's not everybody. That is not everybody. There are some great coaches out there, right? But again, there's the wrong... The per that was the top team that was in Maryland at the time or in Baltimore, right? I know, for example, what was going on there. 
And that's was, they had some great players. Right. Had some very, very good players. Right. Not much came about. And these are players, I, in my opinion, I used to see every practice. I used to go to, because uh, we had to drive there. Right. And I'm, I'm sitting back and watching. This kid's very good. This kid's got a lot of potential. But what happens to that at that point? Why? Uh, and is it because uh, coaches don't have the time? They're, they need to make money, right? So if I need to make money, how many teams do I have to have sure. right, to make money? right? I have a, a wife. I have kids. I have a job, another job. They don't have the time, but yet that's your top club. That's your top club right. Right, that can't produce enough money or salaries to have it full time. And if they do, it's because... I have one, two, three, four teams. Right. And there's no way, and you guys know this better than I do. It's very difficult to run three, four teams. No question. And to pay individual and pay attention to individuals to grow that 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 person. How come you can have the best team, quote right, in the United States, right? One of the best teams, academy wise or whatever, one of the best teams, and no one goes pro. Uh, for me, it's because once you know, once they get out of our control per se, or, or no, they're they in the control. Made, they're in their control. No, no, no. I'm saying, at, like, once they age up above, like they go through college. We're not, you know, I'm, we're not at college level, and we're not at the the pro level as coaches. We're at the youth level. So once they kind of get aged past us, um, I feel like at the national level, especially, a lot of the the, the identification guys. You know, it's always like we need to, to we needed the, the our team to look like the Brazilians, and then once Germany wins, we need our guys to look like the Germans, and then once the Portuguese guys win, oh, we got to do it like they yeah, do, yeah, and yeah. they kind of select players that they think fit those molds. I mean, do you see that? I, I see. It's very subjective. The game's very subjective, right? So that's going to happen. But when you have one of the top teams, I'm just using this for example, in the country, and Baltimore always produces for some sure. of the top teams in the country, and what happens there is it because other things take over after that that is really about the game? It's not just about run and gun, right? It's not being physically stronger. It's not uh, identification is a problem. Uh, is it the scouts that are used in this, area, uh, in this area to where they're asking the coaches mm -hmm. who they think, right. which is backwards to me. This, this scout should have his own opinion. Right, he. If I'm a scout and I'm looking at a team, one, two, three. That's my choice. And now, if they go in hand in hand, we've got something. Right. right. If they don't, well, well, what, what's wrong with these three kids? So now I'm opening instead of the three kids that the coach is picking because who knows what the reason is there? They want them to come to school. They want they they pay money. Who knows? Right. But if I'm a scout. I'm looking and I'm saying, well, this is how this kid's playing. He, he's a little smaller, right? But he's, he can play. This kid can play. Or he's big. He's strong. He, he can do this. He can do this. Now I'm thinking beyond just pa 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 pa. Who won? Who's got soccer points, right? Why they're on top. I don't care why they're on top. I'm looking. I'm coming out and I'm saying, this is a soccer player. Again, but here's the problem. That's my opinion. Right. But I can't, I can't be the scout and be, come to your team and listen to you. Right. I have to say, I'm the scout. This is what I want. This is what the national team, this is what we're playing like Germany, we're playing like Brazil, right, for how Spain is, right, and things are going to change over time. This is what we're looking through the U.S. That doesn't happen. The scouting process is horrible in the United States. One, because of the funding. Yeah. They don't have that, right? So, two, it's, it's a huge country, right? So you're going to need people in different areas, and you're going to have to give somebody adequate time and money to the say resources right? yes the resources to say i'm coming to look at your team mm -hmm. not just once not twice three four times right if i know you're on top and your academy team or you're on the national team you won the national uh league whatever that is i that, that catches my eye one well this must be some of the best players some right some and this is where we have a problem too is because again just because you play the academy doesn't mean that's the best players in the I mean, in the uh, state. Mm -hmm. There could be other reasons. They want to play high school. They want sure. to do this. They For want sure. to do that. So all, you have to have a scout to realize, well, you know, there could be a good player here. There could be a good player here, a good player. And then what is that scout's knowledge? I don't know. Yeah. That's where I think this, where U.S. is struggling right now. I, I really do. And you're saying you don't know what happens when they go to college, right? They, you let them go and they go to college, and who knows what happens from there. 
If, it, if they don't have it by for college, chances are very slim, right, that they're going to go to that next level. I should be able to look at a player and say, this kid, if he keeps this up and learns some other stuff, right, and gets with a quality team or quality coach or whatever, this kid, I, I'm, I'm keeping my own eye on him. And he could be 13. He could be 14. They do it in Europe all the time. They're picking players up at eight years of age, which I think is a little... You know that's uh, that's a little wrong, but they're little, trying to yeah. yeah they're trying to pick players because they see something right. And we right? had they, this academy discussion last week or the week before, but it was about at what age is it too old to kind of say hey now's the time for academy because by the time thirteen fourteen hits, if you're not identified by then, it's kind of late for you. I'd say to I, go to that level. I, it depends see? what I'm looking at. That's where I think we have the problem. It's not the age so much. It is the age, but I'm looking at something. I'm looking at that kid at 12 and 13. Now, let's say he's, I'll give you a perfect example. I was 4'8", 92 pounds at playing at Calvert Hall Varsity. Right. <laughs> you know what would happen usually? I'm, I'm, I'm discarded, right? right. Uh, we were talking the other day, Iniesta. Mm -hmm. Maybe Mesty, right? right? Maybe Xavi, maybe Bernardo Silva, maybe these type of players because they're five foot five, five foot seven. They would have been disregarded years ago in the United States. And again, Paul Scholes, yeah, Paul, Paul Scholes. They, there were people in Manchester United's youth academy that said he'll never be any good. He'll, he's good on the ball, but he'll never be the guy. He ends up being the, the, the what was it? it? Was it like tearing you apart since 1992? The way I look at it is, I look at the. The, the way they play, what they're doing, don't look at the size because they're going to grow. They're going to grow. That has nothing to do with me. Right, right? Sure. So, But the other part does, how they're developing. Now, if I have a kid at 6'5", right, and I don't have to worry about him because he's stronger, he's faster, he's, he's doing his job, right. we're winning, right? So when he's done growing, he's almost done growing, what does he have then? Nothing else, right? Yeah. Now, the kid that's working is bought off and, and figuring this out and developing and, and blah, 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 and he's 5'2", well, he's got that and he's grown. Now he's got both, right? So this is where we have a problem. And that's the part where, as a coach, as a coach of youth soccer, I think we give up on players way too early, circling back. We got to beat such and such a club because to get we got to get points. God soccer points because if not... Our club might not be viable. People will think. But What's your you solution? Do, you, well, I, my, my view is always the long view. Tim, I, I'll tell you. We've won state cups. We've won regional championships. But I don't know how good of a job I've done until later. It'll be the kid that, that, plays, in, that plays in college or the kid that plays pro that comes back and says, hey, thank you. That made the difference. What can you do, okay, to develop kids like you're talking about, uh, being straight with what your, your ideas are? What can you do to enhance that? You say you're still leaving. They're still leaving, but what can you do other than stay away from, I'm going to steer away from that. You want to stay on that path. What can you still do to keep that? Well, what, you, what I do mm -hmm. I, I, I train the kid, not the jersey. So, right. so it doesn't matter to me what color. The, if, mm -hmm. if the kid needs training, I'll help. But, but we try to take a long view approach of it. And if it works, it works. Some parents don't buy in. But, but your track record of kids, usually pretty strong. Like I, I can go back and look at kids that I trained in, in, in the early 90s even and say, look at look how their career blossomed. Kids that, that I trained, uh, you know, in my oldest son's age group. A lot of them playing in college, scholarship players, looking like they could have pro careers. That tells me I did the right thing. And I can't, what other people do, I can't control. No, no. I absolutely can't control. It, it might make me absolutely crazy that a good player says, I'm leaving because the grass is greener over there, and I know the guy that's over there isn't going to bring out the best in that kid. Hey, I can I can lead a horse to water, sure. but I can't keep him from drowning. That's that's the way I look at it. So you always got to try to stay that, but also evolve a little bit too. So what if ne the next thing is to keep people in your club? Well, I know this scout, I know this person, I know this person, and you're we like, do that, actually. and that that's, that's, uh, a, that's that's a way of doing it too. So now if you have it, this person comes out and says, yeah, this is a great player, and he goes to a national camp. 
Right. Right. This person goes here. This person goes here. Maybe that's one way. Yeah. And but I it hope is. that. Yeah. I hope that continues. Yeah. And it's it's difficult. There's no doubt because you're dealing with so many different facets of parents, right? Uh, people making wanting to make money. People going behind your back. Yeah. Right. Sure. Stealing players. For right. Sure. Because of reputations. There's a lot of people that are wannabes. Uh, oh, uh, I always felt uh, like if you're up front with the parents, though, and you say, "Look, this is our mission here. This is what we're doing. We're committed to." developing the players, you know, maximizing their potential. If that's not good enough for you, if we don't accumulate enough got soccer points for you, tally-ho. You know, we'll bring someone else in, we'll develop that kid, and we'll still be the, the same, you know, level that we were with or without him. So a question, uh, Adam, doesn't everybody say this? Doesn't no. Every, oh, in the club? So when you come to my club, in the meeting, in the brochure, in whatever it is, we, this is what we do. Yeah. This is what we do. I'm going to see it all the time. We are going to develop. We are going to do this. We're going to do this. Then you go out there, right? Now they've got 2,000 people. <laughs> it's not happening. All right. Right. Some but people what guess. I see a lot of is come to our club where we're ranked number one. That's yeah. 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 Ranked. That's, that's right. So that's, that's right. the first thing out of their mouth rather than here's what we're going to do. We're going to develop your player to reach its maximum potential. You know, that's our focus here. I don't care what the Got Soccer board says or what the flight of the, the tournament says or whatever, the, what league we're in. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going, right? And so our track record and our reputation says that that's what's going to happen, right? So you're either on board or you're out, and, and that choice is up to you. We can give you all those things you're talking about. We can link you up here. We can, you know, eventually when the time comes and the age is right, start talking about college. And, you know, if it's before that, we start talking about high school. If you're interested sure. in playing in the MIAA, which is the league you mm -hmm. guys played in. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Are you going to stick around? Because we got a really special thing coming up. <laughs> Our next segment is maybe my favorite segment of all time. Well, I'm, let me see. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, let's right. take a look. We are <laughs> off the crossbar, and we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. A while back, I had a lot of problems with my lower back. It started with a muscle called my piriformis. And when that locked up, my lower back locked up. I couldn't coach. I couldn't run. almost couldn't walk. I went to see Dr. Adam Maddox at Ideal Health Chiropractic, and within three sessions, I'm back on the soccer field. I'm able to run, I'm able to lift weights, I'm able to train, I'm able to compete. And not only is he a sponsor of the show, but he's a really, really good guy. I consider him a friend. Check him out if you have any back difficulties, any back pain, even if it's in your IT band in your leg. My man, Dr. Adam Maddox, is the best in the business. Welcome back to Off the Crossbar. I am the coach, Pete Eibner, with the co-coach, Adam, the Miz, Mizell, and Baltimore soccer legend, Timmy Whitman. We love having you here. Thank you. Now, my favorite part of the show. For the reason it's my favorite is because when I had hair, I was a big fan of my hair. My mullet was unbelievable. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. So I honor the mullet. It is time for what, Miz? It's the Patrick Swayze Player of the Week. Because if you want the ultimate, you got to be willing to pay the ultimate price. And I feel like we haven't used the young blood Patrick Swayze mullet. Well, I will say there is our young blood Patrick Swayze mullet. Look at it. It's gorgeous. Absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. By the way, I didn't even remember he was in that until you brought it up. Just so you know, you could do a full 180 if you would go see Adam Maddox at Ideal Health. You could, you would just be able to sit there and see how I couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was struggling. I didn't need a little help here. I'm telling you, Adam, this like that flexibility, just one of the best chiropractors I've ever seen in my can life. Can he help me with my ladders caratus? He can. Well, and, and also with, your, with whatever it is you are touching your leg. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, this week, our Patrick Swayze Player of the Week is... Colton Drought from Browsa, 2004s. 2004s. Goalkeeper. First goalkeeper. First goalkeeper ever to win the Patrick Swayze Player of the Week. Now, 
That's Colton calling right now. He's call, he just got word, and he's calling to, uh, to say thank you. To accept his award. Unfortunately, we will not have him in the studio today. What did he do to earn the award, Coach? He, he was fantastic in their semifinal game. Uh, made two big-time saves, especially in the penalty kick shootout. Helped his team win and advance the State Cup final. Colton, big kid, big-time player, hard worker. Um, Coach Neto talked about him glowingly, uh, saying the, how, how hard he worked, how he's the backbone of that team, how you know, he was just simply outstanding. And uh, so very deserving young man. He's also going to be going to Redeemer as a freshman next year. Not Redeemer, uh, you know, uh, Concordia. Concordia Prep. He'll be going to Concordia Prep as a freshman and expected to compete for that varsity spot in the goalkeeper in the goal, which for a freshman, that's a tall order. But he doesn't look like a freshman in that young blood Patrick Swayze mullet. Well, let's let's put him up there. Ready? One, two, three. Look at him. He's beautiful. Beautiful. That is a I love great it. mullet. You ever have a mullet? I, I was close. I think I was close. I had a perm. I had, uh, I, had perm. Every, I had everything going on back then. Yeah, that is, I had long hair. I had the ponytail. Did you have I, the IROC Z, the, the cherry red IROC Z? Or no, I didn't, didn't have that. No? no, I had a Camaro. Did you? Camaro, <laughs> yeah, the original Camaro. It was okay. my first car ever. Yep, I remember that, yeah. A little bad company on. <laughs> bad, <laughs> company. Company. <laughs> little bad company. Bad company. Yes, yes, that would get me pumped. All right. Very cool. Well, look, Timmy. Thank you for Thank coming you. out, man. Thank you. I appreciate Thanks it. Really so appreciate much for coming it. in. Thank, Thank you. It. Thank you. Everybody, one last time. Oh, my gosh. We ran out of time. Landon Donovan, we will get back to you next week and have you on. We are so sorry we've run out of time. I thought I saw him outside. We, we'll have we to have him. We couldn't get him in. But we thank you. And uh, by the way, parents, kids, if you have a video of you shooting a ball off the crossbar, whether it be in a game or whether it be just kicking it around in your crossbar challenge, send it to us at PeteFastForward at Yahoo.com. We'd love to use it for our intro. All right, one more time. Co-coach Adam the Miz Mizell, Baltimore soccer legend Tim Whitman. I am the coach Pete Eibner, and we are off the crossbar, <laughs> signing off.